are back. You're listening to You Would Think, the Philadelphia Flyers podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Collington. It's a good one today. Joining me, as always, you know it's a good one when I have the one and only Mr. Kevin Durso with me. How are you, buddy? Tired. Oh, man. <laughs> Chuck Fletcher's sure keeping you are. me working. I am sure you are. Obviously, if you're listening to this podcast, you probably already know that it was a massive, massive couple of weeks in, uh, in Flyerville. And we'll be going into that kind of as we get along here. Uh, off the top of the show, make sure you follow us on Twitter at YWT Podcast. Subscribe to the show everywhere, YouTube, et cetera, et cetera. I haven't done it at the top of the show in a while, but follow us on social media. You would think podcast. You'll find us. And uh, with that, do we just want to get right what into What happened? <laughs> this so happened. Like, yeah. So like you and I were talking about before the show, we almost, almost... Sat yeah. here and recorded a show last Sunday after the Flyers traded. By the way, Phil Myers and Nolan Patrick for Ryan Ellis. We'll we'll break this trade down in just a minute. But you and I sat here about a week ago and almost recorded a show. We ended up not because we knew more was happening. But Kevin, how how's the week been? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I would say the best way to describe this week for the Flyers is culture shock in terms of massive changes and not only that but the timing like everything kind of a lot of things happened as a shock i would say not not necessarily like who is gone or who's well who's coming could certainly be a shock i would it say it seemed that, like but. stuff kind of came out of nowhere though it was well, the it, flyers it, are interested boom a deal's done well it was it was timing because i definitely did not think that there would be anything like the, i didn't think we had a reason to almost have a show last week going into saturday <laughs> Like, no, I agree. Saturday with a deadline of what was it, three o'clock? I think was the deadline when the freeze hit. Something and like I, that. Yeah. And I totally took for granted that something was going to happen. It got past one, and I, and I'm like, we're just going to wait for the list. That's right. what. We're just, that's we're what just today riding is. It out. Well, not, well, the list wasn't even going to come out that day. It was right. just we're going to just wait. They're going to sit there and say the freeze happened. That's it. And all of a sudden, two thirty to three thirty on Saturday. Of last week, I should say, because we're recording Sunday morning of the following week. So the previous Saturday when the when the roster freeze hit turned into like trade deadline 2.0. And sure after did. three and after three o'clock, there were five trades that came out or something like that, like post like post deadline as right. if, you know, like as if everybody as they do on a normal trade deadline goes, we've got a half hour to go and we're calling and getting it into the league and no one's going to know about it until Three thirty, four o'clock, maybe. Who knows? Like it could be an hour after this pause has technically taken effect, and you're hearing about moves made all over the league. And it wasn't just the Flyers. Like, no. I, and, and and I said this on I said this on Open Ice Hits with Broads earlier in the week. That I'm sure there were a lot of trades made on Saturday. I think the Flyers probably made the most impactful in terms of the player coming in return. Like I think that was sure. the most blockbuster trade when you look at everybody else who was on the move. I don't think that there was any other other player of that stature who moved teams as, as Ryan Ellis is. So that was mo probably the most significant move of Saturday. And then the funny part was, is that truth be told, like it, it, it was treated like a deadline. And then to think about everything that's happened in the week since, well, they couldn't do anything on Sunday or Monday or Tuesday. So yep. three days went by and I kind of just sat there wondering if there was any news about basically the only news you were looking for was, are they working with Seattle? Because that's about all that can be done. So you're waiting, you know, things and like Seattle that. Seattle answered that question emphatically with their pick. But we can well, talk uh, about yeah, that. but they wait, but they waited until Wednesday to make any. Well, they didn't wait. Frank Cervalli waited until Wednesday at about noon to just say, "Here's the roster." Let's Man, have some I've fun. I've heard a couple of people spectate or speculate and make some jokes about this. Man. Who with the NHL or ESPN slept with Frank Cervalli's wife? Because he went scorched. <laughs> earth on the roster leaks somebody somebody turned around one of the great tweets i think i sent this in the group chat too was um someone tweeted someone now has to like to make up for it someone has to re report early and leak what saravali's kids getting for christmas on like right, christmas they, eve right they're gonna spoil his kids christmas gift in right like spoil his kids christmas because you spoiled the experience and man, it's not and and and, and look spoil in a joking earth. but spoil in a joking term he did his job is what happened i don't he know who sure did. i don't know who decided it was a good idea has an insider in, in, in has an insider ever had a better day than frank Zaravali had on wednesday has he had a better, has anybody had a better week 
No. I mean, that that, I, that I answer mean, is clear. No, I didn't even throw that up there because if you're not following Frank Cervelli right all, now, I mean, he was going you're not getting the, uh, the most up-to-date NHL news, and it's yeah, just that was, simple. He was going all week pretty much. And I mean, don't get me wrong. The, the, the rest of – or not the rest of, but most of the other – bombs that dropped this week when it came to it like certainly the one that we're going to get to the last of these four trades we've got to yep. get to that was an elliot friedman drop he had that's it true. first that's true. so that one and that's expected i mean like when espn and i thought it, let's see let's put it this way and I, I look i did a whole open ice hits with broads about this so i don't feel like we, we have so much to talk about in flyer land that we don't need to talk about this in detail right right Wednesday was a joke for ESPN with that presentation and everybody knew it was going to happen anyway. And some of it was so corny, it wasn't even funny. Yeah. But I think maybe on Friday when the draft happened, this was what it was. Elliot Friedman's on part of, as part of the draft coverage. This is on ESPN. He's never been on. He was never on NBC. I can tell you that. Right. And I guess John Butchergrass, who is hosting, tells people on ESPN, to ESPN viewers, that if you're new here, and new to the hockey coverage, which is now coming back to ESPN as of the expansion draft. Which is beautiful that it, to say. Right, that if you're new here, you might want to follow this guy, Elliot Friedman, because he's he's hockey's Adam Schefter. What a great comparison. Like, that was outstanding. Now you give people a reason to understand his credibility right. around the league. So when he puts out what, what, what de- went down on Saturday as the final trade of this thing so far... And I say so far very seriously because I'm not putting anything past Chuck Fletcher anymore, even though we, you know, let's put it this way. Chuck Fletcher told everybody on Friday, I don't think I'm making another trade for the next week. And then the next day, he made we'll another talk trade. About, we'll talk about, you know, the biggest, maybe the biggest trade of the week. Yeah. It, to sure. me, it is for sure. But, I think, I think so he, you talked about culture change. And I mm-hmm. think from a culture change perspective, it's the biggest change of the week, but we'll, we'll get there as we well, go. Well, yes. But like the, the reason I called it culture shock is because. I wasn't even home when the Ryan Ellis trade happened because right. I went out on that Saturday thinking there's n- not no reason. Nothing's going to gonna happen. But, like, it's, but I didn't even right. – like, let's be fair. I also didn't leave until probably quarter of two. I'm not kidding. Like there's an hour left until the freeze happens anyway. So what I'm am like, I supposed to do? Well, right. But I'm sitting there looking and I'm si- sitting there seeing what like as, as about like lists are going to get submitted, all this stuff. Like people are talking about this. And I'm like, okay, you know what? I – look – I really didn't think anything was going to happen that day. I thought we were just uh, my, my in my mind the the whole wait was everybody's got to get through expansion because nobody knows what they're going to lose, and then they'll go ahead and see what you know what happens next. Like, it, but but we had five days to go from that Saturday, so I really didn't expect anything then. So that was already a shock the first time around. What happened? Somewhat in the immediate aftermath of the expansion draft was not as shocking. I saw a little more of that coming. Right. And then when he comes out on Friday, when Chuck Fletcher comes out on Friday and says, I don't think I'm going to make another trade. And then literally 24 hours later, less than that, makes another trade. And it, and Elliot Friedman had it first and it pops up and I see it pop up. They haven't even made a pick yet. Right. The first round has come and gone. The second round is well underway to the point where... In the 30 minutes it took between the time that the report came out and the trade was officially announced, you got to the Flyers' pick. So they went on TV on NHL Network and go, okay, so the Flyers are on the clock with the 46th pick overall. But before we get to that, we have a trade to announce. But also and there's a trade happening. And right. it's the trade that we were, have all been reading about for the last half hour. Right. So now you're at a point where not only did he do something that he said he wasn't going to do literally the day before the afternoon before – but they haven't even made a pick yet, and I'm gonna like I'm gonna go and have to see. Do I have the? I don't even know if I have, like I didn't even write the kid's name down probably because the picks. <laughs> There's so much write. going on. Oh no, here it is. I do. I did write his name down. So Samu Tovala. Okay. Who is the Finnish kid who was drafted second round, 46th overall? Good winger. Probably is gonna you know could could amount to something pretty special honestly because there were people who had him ranked first late first round kind of great. So does we... it like? It doesn't really matter, I know. But the point being, like, I feel so bad for the kid because the kid just heard his like is going to hear his name called, and it's totally irrelevant in that moment because they just announced a trade for the same team. I was going to say, like, the kid, the kid's got a little bit of that Claude Giroux thing, right? Remember when Bobby Clark goes up and messes up Claude Giroux's name? A little there's something bit, yeah, special so it... about Claude Giroux, or you forgot Claude Giroux's name? Yeah, you know, this kid's got kind of something special. It's like, yeah, they were picking me, but also they were trading like. A major alternate captain, you know, cornerstone of the franchise player while they were picking me. Yeah, you know, it's like somebody who's been here for a decade. Like, 
All right. So you've mentioned it. A, you've mentioned it a couple times, and I, I think the big theme of this week has really been culture change. Sure. Uh, so I'm gonna. I'm just gonna mention. We're gonna start breaking these trades down one by one. So let's here. let's mention each one and kind of go through exactly what happened and then break them down further. So right. we've already touched on. I've already. We've already mentioned the name in the first trade. So Ryan Ellis comes to Philadelphia. But before the trade we, involves Phil Myers and Nolan Patrick. Before we do that, I'm gonna real quick just talking about culture change. I'm gonna list all the players from last year's team okay, that will that's not be on next year's team. Are are you going right. to include as I because I, I see all the banners that we have that we're going to put on screen as we get to each one individually? Right. Are you including in a player that will not return the Seattle pick? Yeah, sure, sure. He, I mean, he did play at the NHL level. It's not like he didn't. I know as, okay, limi so, as limited as it was, I still think it's a difference. I don't mean it's, it's not the same. Right. So either shock way, that the rest of them were, but yes, players from last year. Okay. Phil Myers will not be returning. Nolan Patrick. Shane Gostisbehere, Carson Twarinski, Robert Hag, Jacob Voracek. That is six players from last year's squad. Of those six, five were regulars. Uh, five were regulars. Three played fairly significant minutes. Uh, to me, the other thing I would add to that, uh, well, and it, it's it, for me, this would become at least two. You may argue three when you think about. I guess the Pat Nolan Patrick pick being where it was and the hope for him anyway. Voracek and Gostisbehere were not just moving on like, oh, this is a different, it's going to be a different player now and having played big minutes over their careers. That's also 10 years and seven years at the pro, at the NHL level in, in, in varying rates. Yes. Like Voracek was straight up 10 years, lots of games at the NHL level. Yep. Gostisbehere was a year of like two games where he got basically a mini call up to get a tryout and then never came back because he got hurt. Right. And then six years after that, where he was really involved in you know yeah. playing a, a, a majority of the games the team ever played. These are guys who have been here, and the right. the Flyers Wives Carnival is going to look different, and the promo shoots and the commercials are going to look different. Like it's a different team. It really is. You know what? It, you know what? It might really hit to an extent for maybe. And I'm saying maybe for fans specifically. When people go to a game next year and they have to do, you know, and, and we're wait, you're waiting for the team to come out on the ice and the video's playing and the highlight reel is not going to include the Goss to spare goals or the Voracek plays or maybe, in, you know, I think they still in some occasions used Nolan Patrick's like game winner against Edmonton from a couple years back okay. or or maybe they would even use Phil Myers overtime goal in the playoffs or I'm, like you I'm know pretty sure I mean? they also used Nolan Patrick running Jack Johnson in the stadium series game yeah maybe like stuff like that sure I mean Jake Voracek had the tying goal in that stadium series game I'm sure they've shown that one enough times like it's gonna be di it's gonna be different and you're gonna add like it almost feels a little bit was this was was this all the same off season then was it was after the year that they i mean two different years maybe one was still worse than the other even though last year was significantly frustrating it was obvious when they lost all the games they did in i guess it would have been 06 07 and they knew they needed to take a step i mean that was the off season i think they bring in briere they bring in team and in hartnell like D D notice a That's pattern when you built here. that 2010 team but, but notice a pattern here yep like the whole theme of the first game of the next season was we're going to show you all of the new guys in addition to the returning ones and the returning group probably had maybe 10 people so wait i'm sorry you said they added a, a defenseman from nashville they did and someone from buffalo they did. that year hmm. uh, interesting that that 07 year, yeah, Danny Briere from the Buffalo Sabres. I don't think uh, – look, do I think that the Buffalo trade is going to be as impactful as Danny Briere? No, I do not. Oh, not no, but uh, listen, I'm drawing some parallels, all right? You're making no, moves but with I, the Buffalo you know, Sabres no, but you and the Nashville let's, Predators. Let's draw, let's draw another parallel, if you will. This time around, they acquire a player from Columbus. This has no tie to the previous year we're referring to, but Danny Briere was not the tallest guy in the world. That's kind true. of one of these, hey, look, I'm small, I can be fast, I can score goals. Does that sound like somebody that they may have just picked up? It certainly you know? does. So you got one of those, you got a defenseman from Nashville, which the parallels there are just are ridiculously it's similar. It's insane. It's and insane. Then, and then you do make it like, look, there was something else that I tie in, and maybe we'll tie it in later as we really break it all down. But every team they made a trade with is 
going to more than likely be in the bottom half of the league next year. They, they did not trade and, anything to any contenders. Right. And by the, and and for what it's worth, the reason why I'm saying that has nothing to do with the trades the Flyers made. It actually has to do with other things that those teams have done that make you go, huh? It sounds like they're changing direction too, because before Nashville sends Ryan Ellis to the Flyers, they had sent Victor Arvidsson to the Kings for two draft picks. Yep, and that was okay. mostly. I that think that says was something. I think that was largely a, an expansion draft protection situation, but either way, a little, it's still not great. Well, uh, yes and no, because guess what? That was half the reason why the Ellis trade happened when it did. Yep. That was un, that was made under the gun so that people could be protected. Uh, and all right, let's just dive into that Ellis trade. We've mentioned it a couple of times. So uh, the Flyers send Phil Myers and Nolan Patrick to Nashville. Uh, Nolan Patrick gets flipped to Las Vegas for Cody Glass. Uh, the Vegas Golden Knights end up with Nolan Patrick. The Nashville Predators end up with Phil Myers and Cody Glass. And the Philadelphia Flyers end up with Ryan Ellis. Uh, Kevin, that's a, that's a win, right? That's Flyers this won that was, trade? It, it, we're going to talk about four trades coming up. This is the first one, and it's the best one that they made in, in the course of the week. I agree. That, 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 that doesn't mean that I don't think that there's good in most of what they did. It's This, this is first, the home the first, run deal. Well, well, here, and here's the reason. If you would have told me in an off season where they make four trades within a week, which by the way, when was the last time they made four? Anybody made four trades in a week <sighs> at the, at this level? I mean, you don't see wheeling and dealing like this. No, you no, know? this is wheeling and also dealing. Right yeah. now, it, but if you would have told me the very first thing you do, and it's pre-expansion draft, by the way. So before you even get to the expansion draft, which I thought was the marker for let's get started here with the off season plans, like you're going to get to the expansion draft, and you're going to basically because it's expansion draft. The draft was over the weekend. The free agency period opened a week from then. And you probably in that time frame to kind of go along with exactly what's happened so far because it's this has all been done in seven to eight days. Yeah, this this honestly feels opinion, like yeah. Chuck's playing NHL 21. He's like, all right, right I got to make right. some trades. Which, which, by the way, totally discredits some of the stuff I've said before because I sit there and I tell people, don't act like you can do this like playing a video game because it doesn't work that way. And, and Chuck, Chuck Fletcher, and Chuck hold Fletcher my sit, beer. Right, and Chuck Fletcher goes, just wait a second. Let me just pop up franchise mode here and I can just click a couple things and we'll get, you know. Also, I, I, I did laugh, by the way, and we're going to get into his press conference like at the end of all this because it's like he kind of sat down and really summed up the whole point of the offseason after making the fourth trade of the week. But he joked that he's had to do more arithmetic than he would like on all this stuff, which I knew was the case. Like, I mean, let's just wait. He made one trade, and I was sitting there trying to figure out by trading those two players, taking on a bigger contract technically. But wait, when expansion happens, who do you lose? How much money do you get back for that? And what if you lose this guy, and then you try to trade this guy? Like, like I wouldn't want to be... The one keeping do, track of the Philadelphia Flyers do, money this do you un- week. Do you understand why I said I'm tired now? Yes. Because before before Wednesday even hit, I was sitting there in my head going, well, if you do this and then this, that opens up money to make that work, and this could happen, and then, like, like it, th- it was just... Uh, let's so, just like, I can't imagine how many different possibilities they went through, because they probably looked at about 20 players in, in turn just to try to figure out what was the best fit, what was right. I did it with, like, five, and... <laughs> And so, moved a couple, had a couple moving parts, right? So we talked about culture change, but I think the other theme of this week has been cap juggling. And we've seen oh, that sure. number kind of go up and down. And part of the way we did that, uh, the Flyers added almost $4 million to their cap with Ryan Ellis. Obviously, Nolan Patrick's on some, whatever. You get right. what I'm saying. The the offseason in general, by the way, like as we're talking about this, this first trade and the last trade we're going to get to when we talk right. about these, you've seen... And I think that the first and the last fit this description perfectly. You've seen good old fashioned money for money hockey trades right. that are the only way you're going to juggle the cap. It's really been the only way. Well, and the other way you juggle the cap is okay, so we're gonna just touch on the fact that uh Carson Carson Twerinsky was selected by Seattle. That kinda happened. We're going kind of chronologically here. Ellis happened first, Twerinsky happened right. second. But then after that, for cap reasons, the Philadelphia Flyers made another trade. And this is right. a trade that we've kind of heard tale of for a long time. For roughly the last 18 months to two years, we've kind of heard that Shane Gostaspear is on his way out of town. Uh, that finally happened this week. Uh, you package Gostaspear a second and a seventh to Arizona. In right. return, you receive $4.5 million in cap space. Okay, so let's let's, and this is the way this show is going to go because there's no way around it. It all happened so quickly. 
I want to jump back to the Ellis trade for just a moment. You can leave yeah, the banner. Yeah. You can leave the banner up. We don't need to change the banner, but I want to jump back to it because all these topics are interwoven. Right, right. If you would have told me that the very first thing that they do in the off season, and it's before the expansion draft even happens, before your list has to even be submitted, that the first thing you're going to do is actually get the piece that I've been saying for a long time since the season ended, which we're going on two and a half months now since the flyer season ended anyway, that this is the thing you needed to get the most. If you did nothing else in the off season, but address the Matt Niskin in void, who Top plays with Provorov, who yep. plays with Ivan Provorov. You know what you did? That's right. Right here. You not only got Ivan Provorov a partner, you got him a long-term partner. I was going to say, I want to stop you right there. You said fill the Matt Niskanen hole. No, no, no. This is a significant upgrade over Matt Niskanen. Well, I, and I would agree because, I right. mean, let's this way. Not only, I, well, because I, I write down in my notes anyway, it's, it, it's your number one need. You had to improve the defense. We knew that. I, like, the second note I have, and I, you know that, look, I don't do open ice hits if I don't watch a lot of games around the league. I watch a lot of Nashville games because... I've always liked their team. I've liked their team for the last five years, and obviously there's a changing of the guard going on there as well because they've made some trades that indicate that. So I've always liked Ryan Ellis's game. There's no reason to me. I look at him. And I go. There's, there's no, no reason, reason not to. There's no reason not to. He's stable. He's very stable. And even even in the playoffs this year, and we knew they weren't a, good, a great team when you put them up against the other teams in that division. It didn't matter who they played in that first round as a four seed. They were going to either play Carolina or Tampa or Florida, and we went. It's going to be a bit of a mismatch, but they held their own in five straight games separated where the margin was basically a goal for most of it. And some of them low scoring, like they played well defensively. They did a really good job hanging in that series. And Ellis is a big part of that. And, Absolutely. I, I, and I know that, look, we can argue about the injuries and things like that. He's had injuries before. Now, he also came on his press conference and said, I don't know what you're talking about with a shoulder injury. I, I, had a I, I shattered my knuckle. Right. Or a so, knuckle, right. Like, so maybe there's nothing to it. And maybe we get to training camp and find out he's perfectly fine. He's ready to go. He's energized. And, 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 you've, for... addressed, and you've addressed the need big time. And, and similar, and again, similar to Niskanen, as you mentioned, he's a leader. Yeah. Al alternate captain with Nashville, a guy who had been there similarly to some of the guys that we talked about being moved out of Philadelphia, a guy who had been there forever, a guy who literally, I think, came on and said, I've never been traded before in my life, so I don't really no. know how to feel because it's a shock, but I'm excited to go to Philadelphia. Right. So and for that was a common theme with a lot of it was I'm shocked because this is like, I don't know what this is like, but I'm ready to go to the next chapter. Right. And And for a while... Uh, there have kind of been two big defensemen in Nashville. It's been Ryan Ellis and Roman Yossi, and they've played together a lot. And you know, and let's be realistic: Roman Yossi wasn't going anywhere. No, and Roman Yossi has gotten the media attention and the Norris votes and the et cetera, et cetera, because he is a little more offensive than Ryan Ellis. But it's a, there, it's, and, it, and it's a bigger contract. And right. I just, and quite frankly, if you would like any, but if after trading Victor Arvidsson in the first place, if right. you would like people to still be really invested in maybe the direction you are thinking about heading. I mean, it's been a real changing of the guard offseason in Nashville. Nashville's and, had it. And, yeah. and well, and here's the thing. And it started with nothing more than a personal choice, which is Pekka Rene says, it's time I'm retiring. I still so, can't believe they've only had one general manager in their franchise history. That's insane to me. I mean, listen, here's the thing too, though. He's pushed a lot of the right buttons over the years. He's done a really good job. And I know, I know there's going to be people who look at this offseason and go, well, now I think you're rebuilding a little bit. But oh, well, they, they are. But, and, right. But When, when Pekka Rene retires, you, you don't really trade, have a choice. You weren't going to trade your captain. Right. That just wasn't that. So Yossi was going to be safe no matter what. I don't know, man. I, I know you said but you're I not going to trade your captain, but if I'm, if I'm Claude, I'm a little nervous right now. Chuck's got no. his trading fingers on. <laughs> If I'm Claude, I'm not nervous because I, I, I actually think that when Claude Giroux came out at the end of the season and talked about being pissed off at the position they're in and not and wanting to win and not liking the losing, they, I think some of these trades were made I, I think for they Claude Giroux. I think they consulted with him and not said, hey, who should we get, but said, like, do you do you care who goes? Do if you we, mind if we trade away Shane like, Goss' bear? No, I, I, I was going to say it's the other one to me. It's the, We're going to trade away a guy who's been here with you for 10 years. He's been on your do wing. You, Right, who's been on your wing for most of it? Do you mind it? Like, do you understand that we might have to do this if you really want to win and get better potentially? Man, I, you know, the, you said it a couple of minutes ago, and you're right. It really is sinking into me that the the pregame video packages, yeah. the 
like the the hype videos the it's it's gonna be weird right so, so either way back, so let me get back yeah. to th- th- this trade for a minute because yeah, of the fact yeah. that we've talked about ryan ellis and the fit that he is let's talk the compensation for a moment because to me it's not like this is what makes it a good deal you're basically the the, the common theme that i got out of it was is that and look, Ryan Ellis and Phil Myers are not built the same way. They're not the same size defensemen. I get they're that. They're not the same player. No, for but, sure. But they're both right-handed shots. The the goal, I would say, with Phil Myers, similar to what Ryan Ellis is going to do, is you wanted Phil Myers to play the top pairing minutes potentially. You, right. you, you took a leap of faith with him that he was going to continue to grow. He did not have a good year. And that's the – not the end of that, but it's like, okay – well, if that he, is the end of that in well, Philadelphia. Well, it, it turned out to be, but like, you're sitting here going, I, but what I had said was is that it didn't mean you had to trade him. It was just curb expectations, just a little bit like right. pull back. I don't think anybody second, had given up on Phil pair, Myers. Right, second pair, third pair, and you probably will like what he gives you. I just don't know that he can be a top pair guy, which makes it more important to go out and get that guy. So you balance him out. Like, if they didn't trade, if, if Phil Myers was not in this trade package, let's just say, hypothetically, and you acquire Ryan Ellis while keeping Phil Myers, then Phil Myers is probably the guy who's next to Travis Sanheim next year still. And you balance out your third pairing, and you kind of move on from there. But right. but the uh, the as as is the case with a lot of trades, especially old fashioned hockey trades, as I called it, you're going to have to give to get. So if Phil Myers turns out to be a really solid two pairing defenseman, if he turns out to maybe he does turn out to be a top pairing guy down the road. The problem is you don't know the answer. So yep. what did you do? You got something where you know the answer. Ryan Ellis has played in that role for years. So you go ahead and you say, I'm not only getting what I need, I'm getting him for the long haul. And oh, by the way, in in, in in addition to having to give to get and say, well, I'm going to take the chance that Meyer's potential doesn't match the stability that Ellis already brings. How about getting rid of a guy who has been in conversation for so long, who's been a polarizing figure because of where he was drafted and then the results that have followed since. And you move on from Nolan Patrick, which I thought the writing was on the wall with this. And not only that, because it's always been about, it's it's the combination of expectation and experimenting with where he could fit versus his health versus the inconsistencies in his game. And look, he's going to a team that knows him well. I right. Mean, the GM there the was GM his GM in juniors. Is, is, it couldn't be a more perfect fit for him. Right. Kelly if McCrimmon he's, if was he's his a, GM. And, and, quite frankly, and, and quite frankly, maybe the actual analysis of this trade or of Nolan Patrick going from Nashville to Vegas after going in this trade for Ellis right. is if you, if you don't find a way to turn it around there, you're never going to make it. Right. Well, here's here's the thing about that trade is because it was technically a three way trade. I think it has the potential to be one of those rare three way trades where everyone's happy because I think Nolan Patrick could easily develop, especially in a system where his path to number one center is clear. Right. He's got a better pedigree than Chandler Stevenson. If he lives up to his hype, if he lives up to the potential that got him drafted number two overall kind of the consensus number one for 12 months before his draft if that nolan patrick comes back vegas has a damn good you know first second line center down the road well let's put it this way what have i always said about nolan patrick too to an extent too is what happens when you go from being told for your entire life you're outstanding you're above the level you're you're playing you're you're the the best best. and then you get drafted second overall which is still not a knock on you but the ex- you're going to unless you're Mitch Marner's dad, but <laughs> but you're going to a city that's going to look at second overall pick and think Patrick Line, Jack Eichel right, right away, especially and especially since you're literally following up those years. I mean, it was literally right after that, so people were thinking that's who is that the type of player that they just got, and it never came close nope. to that level. So because of Showed that, some flashes, you know, oh certainly. It, it was the lack of consistency, the lack of staying healthy, and overall just what's the guy's fit? Like there was, yep. we just questioned it too much, and it just you know, here's okay. We right. said, and you're looking, we, at, no, and you're looking at your said, roster, and you're going Couturier, right. Hayes is making seven. Where does Nolan Patrick fit? And not only that, but okay, right. like common theme coming up as well. We've been talking culture shock. We've been talking about making changes and changing kind of the way the room is and all that stuff like that. 
a common theme also is, is that you sit there and you go, it was time, you know, and you're going to hear agree. that more often as we talk about other moves that are made. But you look at this and you go, you know what? It was just time. I don't know if you could – all you were going to do if you brought him back, and it was funny because like I think a week before the trade happened, uh, Chuck Fletcher had said, we're going to qualify all of the RFA's offers at least. You right, because I mean? why not? But, right. right. So like it wasn't – but it wasn't the most shocking thing. And like you just got this sense, it's time. If you, what are you gonna do? You're gonna just keep moving this down the line and continue to do one year qualifying offer, one year qualifying offer, and oh, oh maybe he'll turn it around then. Oh, maybe it'll be next year. Maybe like, like what but are you? What if he doesn't? To, right. At what point what you do you lock him do? up for three or four are, years at two well, million dollars? Well, no, I'll don't. tell you. I'll tell you when it happens. It's when he's no longer an RFA. Like right now, because he's an RFA, you kind of could have sat there and said, "We'll do next year," and then if he's still in, when he's still an RFA. Maybe the year after that, and then it, until you use up all of his RFA years and finally go, all right. And then maybe, you lose like, for nothing. But but how much? But how many more years yeah. are you supposed to do? So you're supposed to kick this down the line for two more years and two more seasons and say, well, by the fourth season, well, and last we season hope was he's figured his, it out by the time he's 25. Right, and last season was technically his fourth season, if we will, because he he missed his third season entirely. So right. what are you supposed to do? Say the fifth season, the sixth season is when he finally. Puts it all the, like you just can't wait any longer. You needed a better team and you needed a change. And this was a change that was, quite frankly, on the smaller level. He was almost like a throw into this deal because Nashville turned around and said, wait, can we use him to get something else from right. Vegas? And then you, they flipped him straight they for Cody Glass, him. another high draft pick who has kind of uh, not, not out quite yet. lived up to expectations. Right. So, I, like I said, this has potential to be a really good trade because, again, Nolan Patrick gets that change of scenery, and right. he also get, gets to go play under uh, Kelly McCrimmon, who he played for in Brandon. Uh, right. Nashville. I, I, I think that because for people who say we're going to we're going to talk about the potential and what happens if the, this guy becomes or that guy becomes, it, it's more possible with Myers than it is Patrick and Myers. I don't necessarily agree with that. I still I th think well, Nolan Patrick has the pedigree, and he's going to get the opportunity. I, no, no, no. I'm not. I'm not saying that either. Like either one, both, like both couldn't pan out. But I think it's more likely that Meyer. We're hearing about Myers being a successful NHL player. I don't know, man. More than Patrick. I just uh, there's something. I think Nolan that I Patrick scores thirty goals within the next three seasons. My thing, my you know what my thing with him is, is though honestly, and it, it's not. It's not that I don't think he could pan out in Vegas because if he's going to do it there, like if he's going to do it anywhere, it's going to be there. Yeah. It's my question is not even that he lives up to any potential. It's I don't even know if he's going to stay healthy enough throughout the course of his time before someone turns around and goes, he's just damaged goods and the career is almost over. Well, and we talked about it. Look, I, and I don't look. I hope that that's not the case. I don't want to wish that someone's career ends on anybody. Well, I just we, I have my doubts with that one. Well, we talked about it while he was here. It's not a knee that's going to nag him forever. It's not a back. It's not a blah blah blah. It's a genetic migraine disorder that may or may not have been triggered by concussions that parts whatever but in theory once you kind of get that thing under control you can keep it under control and it, again he didn't have any too many problems this year again he didn't look good on the ice but as far as the health was a, a concern it wasn't really a concern this year right yes and no because now he turn around. I mean, I don't know if you saw his availability when he went once he got to Vegas. Or, I did not. Or, 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 he brought up. He didn't say migraines last for last year. He said concussion. So I don't know what the truth is anymore. You know, like we're like there's almost wonders if the team covered up the. I kind of like, have to trust the player symptoms. on this one. Yeah, but 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 no, but like as as in the team did the player a favor in terms of covering up that it wasn't a concussion, or that it was a concussion by saying it was something else. Right or 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 concussion symptoms, if you will, or whatever. Like I, he, they tried to make it sound like it because oh, they've got a family history of this. That's what he's experiencing, and it's just a problem. When reality might be that it had to do with the concussions from over mm -hmm. the years, and he was maybe. still battling. So, uh, maybe I don't know. I'm not. We're, I'm not going to go into it with that. He's I don't not, know if we're ever going to know for sure. He's, and he's not a flyer anymore, so it's not right. a concern like to the flyer specifically. But whatever, it doesn't make it like I'm not saying whatever. It doesn't make a difference. But it's like he's he's going to move on, and we'll see what happens. He's yep. got it. He could he could completely a thousand percent pan out and become a really good player. No doubt about it. So and you just he, know. You just know if the Flyers make a run this year. And again, we're we're way too early, and you know the team we saw last year right. certainly not blah blah blah. But if they make a run this year, you know who's waiting for him in the final, and it's absolutely Vegas and Nolan Patrick. 
one hundred percent. You're are you only saying this and, and look, I get it because it would be Because fitting. I've been a Flyers fan for too long. No, no, but are you also only saying this because if you like you could pick any of the other teams they traded with too, but at the same time you're gonna sit there and go like reading between the lines that none of those teams, because of what they've done, are probably gonna be there. So you're picking well, let's the talk team. about the trade. We got the graphic on the screen. I mean, well, it, we're not worried quick, about the okay. Arizona Coyotes being right, there. Right. Well, now, hold on a second, because and I'm tie, I will tie it into the one that's on the screen. So real quick, I'm going to go back to Twarinski and the Seattle expansion for a moment because this trade, to me, only happens because of what happened with one Wednesday with expansion. Because, okay. because if, if Seattle does what everybody thought they were going to do... Take JBR. One, well, no, one way or another then, which is... Or check. <laughs> which is pick a big contract or not take a big contract, but at least take a player who is on the current roster, like, like a Robert Haig. Right. Then, so, then at least we knew, like we we felt like there was going to be a player who was on this current roster, not necessarily Carson Twerensky, who was going to go as part of expansion. Yep. And and it was going to be around that process. And we thought a bunch of different combinations. We thought maybe they just say we're a brand new team with no cap. Let's get Shane Gosses bear because he's only four and a half million, which in the grand scheme of things may not be that much when you when we look at other players we might pick. I, right, Fair. and I think JVR was another pretty popular pick because he, he was, some, but, some but top seven million is a big difference. But seven million is a big difference between four and a half. Like I kind of, I, I tried to yeah, stay Seattle's conservative. Got Thirty million dollars in space after everything. I know, right? It's to, not, it's not like they were okay. That's close. because Se- that's because Seattle did something that I don't think anybody saw coming, which was passed on like every big name that was they out went there, like, young and cheap, like, and yeah. like, like here's the thing. I know that everybody, the re- initial reaction to Seattle taking Carson Twerinski is, what? Like, are you kidding? Here's the thing. If Seattle takes Carson Twerinski from the Flyers, but also in turn took Gabe Landeskog from Colorado or took Carey Price from Montreal and puts that kind of money into that kind of player who's going to be part of your... It would make a lot more your, sense. Right. Like, then you understand why they're going to lowball another team and go, we're taking one of the lowest contracts you have because you we can't need take, to fill up... You can't take seven big contracts. Right. Right. Like... But you can take two or three to build your team around. So and I could have seen they took one. Like, like I could have seen them taking, and I don't know. Like, was there another good defenseman out there beyond that? Like, I like well, kind of they did in a way because they took free agents like that. Like they took right. Adam Larson. So that's not a shock. But like, could you imagine if they would have taken Gabe Landeskog and then said, you know what, we can get an in, in addition to him playing center, we can go behind him and get Ryan Johansson from Nashville. And get a, and get even if and maybe not carry price, but what about Braden Holtby in goal and build the team around three or four really good solid like big con, bigger contracts, but, but players that have a reputation, right? And then for the rest of it, go. You know what we need outside of that? We need guys like Mason Appleton and Colin Blackwell to fill this thing out and be the depth guys. And they're not going to cost a lot of money, and they're going to be good. They can be good players for us. And it would have made all the sense in the world if they would have done that. I would have said this team's a playoff team, but they're not a right. playoff team right now based on what I see. They're not a playoff team right now. No. Well, they only have nine forwards right now, so <laughs> they're definitely well, not a playoff team at the moment. Well, they don't, but I get where you're going. So, bottom line, though, being the thought was maybe like I thought worst case scenario, the the best thing that could happen was, all right, they just take Shane Gosses Bear, and if they take Shane Gosses Bear, you get the four and a half million in cap space. It's not the seven million that JVR makes. It's not the eight point two five million that Jake Voracek makes. But it's something and it's a starting point. And maybe, you know, and if and 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 I said worst case scenario because of the fact that at worst it's goss despair and it's just the pick. As in, you didn't have to sweeten the deal, you didn't have to make a side deal, you just got rid of he a just takes your, for he, yep. for a substantial enough cap hit that you now actually still have the flexibility to play with what was still on the table through last Saturday, through the expansion draft, through Thursday even. The first over or first overall first round pick is still on the table at that point, and you're right. still sitting there with it. And if they take Shane Goss to spare in the four and a half million dollar cap it, and you open up money, now you might sit there and take one of the other guys and go. By the way, here's that first round pick as well, because because right. for me it was and and we knew about this being a possibility for over a week leading up to the, where the Ellis trade happened, and so after the Ellis trade, I even said. I'd be shocked if he keeps the pick. There's just no way. He's he's dangling it too much. Right. He's not he, he's not interested in making this pick with what he could possibly do with the pick to get something back in return. Okay, with what he could possibly do. So Goss's bear to me after expansion though, because you knew you needed money, was as good as gone. I just could like I couldn't bring myself every other player that they had passed on of the five that were out there that you, that would have made the most sense in my mind. 
I, I look, I go, Jake Voracek, we know the conversations happened to this point that it might, like, he might be moved, but there's never guarantees. If And if he comes back, I understand his cap hit, right? Everybody doesn't like the cap hit, but you, but you know what you're going to get. You're going to get 55 to 65 points probably in a full 82-game season because minimum. that's what he is. He's yeah, been that for his entire assists. career, and... He's going to, right, you're going to get a lot of assists and you're going to get a decent amount of points. And even if not 55 to be conservative, say 50, he's right. usually done that. So you're going to get that. Like, I mean, he in the shortened season, they just played in 56 games. He had 43 points. He'll get to 50 in an 82 game season every single time. Every year. So you know what you're going to get. But, you know, I know you don't love the cap hit, but you know what you're going to get. JVR. It's, you know, you're, you're, you're not, you're not opposed to the, what happened because he had one of the better offensive seasons last season. So you're right. going to go and I Him still and Joel see, Farabee were your only two decent forwards who looked like they cared last right. year. So you're sitting there going, I'm not heartbroken over keeping him. He scored. Absolutely a, he, not. He, he, and, and, and you think about what he's good for in terms of goals, right? Like I, you think I wouldn't he, hate good seeing for JVR goals. wearing a this year. Ooh, that's good. I didn't think about that. Yeah. I don't I necessarily don't, know. You and I had a little conversation about team leadership yesterday. Per, and personally, I, I, I don't surprise. Wouldn't be surprised. Personally, I don't think he. I don't think it's going to happen. Personally, I, 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 don't, I don't think disagree he's going to get. I think a new guy is going to get the other alternate, just because. And and like like I said, we'll get into it in a couple minutes because we're going to get to when what Chuck Fletcher said after picture all this. did get traded. <laughs> well, we're going to get into what Chuck Fletcher said, and that's what's the oh, big. Okay. That's what the big thing is because what he said kind of tells you tells me why these outside guys mean something to the leadership group. All right, but 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 everything else leading up to so. Even Robert Haig and Justin Braun, I went, they've got roles. Everybody's got a, a spot that I can understand how they still fit on the team. I just don't know. Like, Gostas Bear could have been a third-pairing defenseman and power play specialist, and I would have understand the fit from a usage standpoint. I just didn't understand the fit from a cap standpoint anymore. It was like, right. I don't know how you're supposed to do anything else. You need a backup goal. You need more defensive help. You could use another forward. And we're still, and by the way, to that point, we're still talking about this, you know, the Vladimir Tarasenko rumor, and could they get a score in in addition to this, and all that yeah, stuff. The Tarasenko and, rumors were strong. And the thing about that, but the thing about that was, is I'm going none of this, or maybe only one of those things, is possible if you don't trade somebody like Shane Gossespierre and open up the cap. So right. this felt like it was predictable. It's a little bit of a rough look on the surface because the rough look is, I you didn't as, get I, as, back. As, as it's written down. There's nothing that actually it says comes to Philadelphia. What comes to Philadelphia is money. Relief. You open up money. Yep. That's what that's what comes to Philadelphia. And well, Shane Gosses Bear again, maybe Shane Gosses Bear is another one of these guys, like Nolan Patrick, that you kind of sit there and go, Maybe it was time. And Chuck took that money and looked at Shane Gosses Bear and said, I'm losing a good, talented offensive defenseman. And Chuck said I also have a first round pick burning a hole in my pocket and I need right. to replace and get another good defenseman. Well before before you yeah, okay, well you clicked anyway. That's okay. No, go ahead. Let, okay. You can you can pop it up. Okay, so then this trade so, happened. Right. So, so right before this trade though, to this point, we've gone through two now. And you've given you've gotten exactly what your biggest need was in the offseason for Myers yeah, and, and Patrick. You and don't you love dumping a second and a seventh to get rid of Goss Spear, but it's not the end of the world. You're doing the what you got to do. The seventh is not uh, honestly. If seventh freaking, is nothing, but the right, second. If round you're fits. freaking out about the seventh, then you don't know how the draft. No, works. no, no. The second if is you the big are, deal. Right. If the second can be a big deal, but it, again, it's still no guarantee. So if you're moving the cap space with something, which very clearly we all sat there and felt there's something else that's going to happen as a result of this. You're not just going to sit there and make a trade like this to open up cap space and then not utilize it. The only question left was, does it get through draft weekend? And we utilize and like it's utilized. They go, we utilize this afterwards in free agency, or right. is it something else on the or surface? Or are we doing it to do something else? And it took twenty four hours, and then this one happened. And now, this bomb dropped. Okay, so so let's so the, let the, the trade on the board here. It's uh, Rasmus Ristolainen was sent to the Philadelphia Flyers, and in in return. Uh, no retention on that, by the way. One year left, making I believe five point four million. Yes. And in return, the Philadelphia Flyers sent Robert Hag, the thirteenth overall pick in the twenty twenty one NHL draft, and a second round pick in the twenty twenty three draft. Now, yes, if you've been following the last two trades, yes, that is next year's second round pick and twenty twenty three second round pick out the window. Just worth noting, <laughs> right? Okay. So, uh, and in return, Rasmus Ristolainen. Okay. Rasmus Ristolainen is a polarizing player. 
There's no question Correct. about it. And, and and for multiple reasons. To be fair, he's, so was Shane Goss's bear. Sure. He's, <laughs> he's had his moments in bad ways. He's also played for, quite literally, the worst run organization in the NHL. The Arizona Coyotes have something to say about that, but it's close. <laughs> It's well, okay, fine, but the turnaround, uh, the turnaround in Buffalo has been higher than in Arizona. Well, Arizona still got that Datsu contract, that Zetterberg con. Are they still paying Pronger? <laughs> I don't know, but that's I, I understand where you're coming from. <laughs> the, okay, so that's the, but that's the okay. So this is the difference then. Arizona has taken like to make cap floor. They're a cap mule. Has yeah. has taken on the big contracts that nobody has anymore or whatever. Like like we got to move this guy to. I free up Datsuk cap space, is still a coyote, like Datsu and Pronger yep. and things like that. Right. Okay. So I get that. But at least Arizona has had some consistency with their roster at times and has sure. not put, and has not like put themselves out of play. Neither, I guess neither as Buffalo in the grand scheme of things, but has not put themselves out of play to have guys like Phil Kessel and Taylor Hall on their roster. And in fairness to Arizona, to actually appear in a playoff series. Now, again, I think it was, look, was it a technicality because it was during the um, bubble? Yeah. Sure. But here's the thing. They went into the bubble and then beat Nashville in a series. So they were still hanging around. They were kind of That's a little, fair. they were kind of that year, a little spitfire of a team. They looked a little Cinderella-ish for a hot second. That's fair. Sure. Okay. Buffalo has not had any success of that type of sort since 2011. Yeah, that's valid. They're a dumpster they, fire. They lost. They lost a game seven to the Flyers in 2011 and have not come close to sniffing the playoffs ever since. I don't feel bad for Coyotes fans because there aren't any. I do feel bad <laughs> for Sabres fans. I hear you. So here's That's where fair. I'm at. So here's where I'm at with this. Okay, it, like the question becomes with Ristolainen, is it him or is it the team? And I don't look. I don't mind. I, I said this on the air too on Friday. Don't mind trading Robert Haig. I agree. Robert Haig probably at bet like to me was a six or a seven. He was either going to play third pair or he was, was going to be your extra. And someone that you could slot into that role and say, when we need you. I should have worn my Robert Hag jersey for this show. <laughs> oh, boy. Because so, I do have one. Oh, so you're not. Again. Uh, well, you're having an OK weekend, but you know what I mean? Like my significant other is uh, is a large Robert Hag fan. OK. For some reason, it's a meme. That's okay. My significant other has a Shane Goss's jersey, or had one. Oh or has no! One, or yeah, we're both in the same boat, so it's fine. But um, yeah, but now you get to buy her a sweet Kachina jersey. <laughs> Think about I, that. I love. I do love those jerseys. They you can't my, not they, love the Kachina. They're my. They are my favorites. I don't know about. I don't even know. They are wearing them full time again next year, though. So That's true. But anyway, back to the back Ryan, to the trades. We got to stick with trades. The, the Ryan Ellis trade, I right. think it was a pretty clear win for the Flyers. Right. The Shane Gosses Bear trade is super hard to grade because again, you're trading for nothing and you're trading for caps. The space. Shane Gosses Bear one almost doesn't even get a grade because it kind of like you know what the Shane Gosses Bear one is? It's an incomplete because right. you it's open hard. up money and you go. It's what you do next that could make a difference. Now, and here's the thing. Well, this in is what the, they did next. Well, in the immediate. There are two schools of thought because you can look at the defenseman they, that they got in, in Ristolainen, and as I said on the air on Friday after the deal happened, the pros are if you thought this team was soft, if you thought this team wasn't physical, part of the problem is solved. You will not get pushed around. You will not be lacking physicality from this particular player. I can. I tell think you Ryan that. Ellis made strides for addressing that also. Just just wanted to put that in here. What Ryan, in Ryan Ellis's case, it's not necessarily being physical as much as it is. I look at him and I say, for his size, and again, a lot of people got on that because I go, oh my goodness, they traded for a 5'10 guy. He's tenacious. But he, he uses is, his size he well. Is, but he is tenacious. He is as hard of a worker and as determined as it. Like, let's this way. Matt Niskanen wasn't the biggest guy in the world. I mean, he was over six foot, but he wasn't the biggest guy he in the was world. Six one, six two. He right. wasn't much over. Right? And let's put it this way: to stand next to, and I, maybe I, maybe I'm the one who can say this more than other people, I guess. But to stand next to him in the room, you wouldn't exactly think the guy was the most, you know, hard hitting dude in the world. But he could deliver in right. a lot of ways. Like he's a tough guy, and so I didn't, didn't, I didn't hate anything about that at all. Then we get to wrist line and I go, and I, that's the first thing I can take from it is if you didn't like, like if you looked at this team and went, Oh my goodness, they are so soft. It's They're terrible. Pushed like, around, right. And we, and how many times we come on after whatever games, you know, nine, nothing or eight to three against the Rangers and stuff like that. And all those awful games and sit there and go, do you see this? They're softer than Charmin out there. Like it's terrible. Like, you know, 
So if you didn't like that, then this is part of a solution for sure. The rest of it, though, is the question mark because did you upgrade from a defensive standpoint? I don't know. I don't know either. (laughs) Um, So Robert Hag was barely getting in the lineup. And Shane Gossespierre was the guy splitting with him, basically. Right. So you traded your sixth defenseman, because on some nights it's Robert Hag and some nights it's Shane Gossespierre. And you got a guy who's going to sit pretty consistently in your top four. Now, can can I say this for it, too? Because I know a lot. For me, the player was less of the problem in the deal and more the inclusion of the first round pick. Like, right. Like here's, it's here's not, and I'm not trying to sit here and defend Rasmus Ristolainen as a good or great player. What I'm trying to get at is the player coming back to me didn't like, if you would have said you got acquired Rasmus Ristolainen for, and it wouldn't have, this would have never happened. But if it was for Robert Hague and the, and the second round pick in 2023 or even 2022, I would have said, or guess what? Maybe even 2021. Like yeah, this, sure. This if weekend, you're not trading your first, sure. right? If you didn't trade your first and you said it's Robert Hagen a second for Ristolainen, I would have probably sat there and said, you know what, it's okay. I would be sitting here saying that's a good trade, not great, not a home run, not a blah blah blah, a good solid trade. What I will say, and again, not defending Ristolainen specifically, but if to defend the first or first round pick being part of the deal. On the surface, what's going to happen is what you're going to see is you're going to sit there and go, that's the player they gave up the first round pick for. And it's right. fair to look at it because when you go back and actually read what did this player take, what did it take to acquire this player, that's going to be there forever. There's no changing it. That's what you traded it for him specifically. Right. If I tried it, what I'm trying to do is separate from it and go, look at the collective picture and, and say, so if you traded Phil Myers, Nolan Patrick, Gossis Bear, 2022 second, 2022 seventh, Robert Haig, 2021 first, 2023 second. And for the record, that if player I, is Isaac Rosen. Right. The player drafted at 14. But if I if I go into my head and I say, to get both of those players, it involved the first round pick, I wouldn't have felt shocked if it took that to get Ryan Ellis. So I go, I so I go if you traded the first and act like the, realistically what the gain was, was Ryan Ellis – then maybe you can live with it a little more. Now, granted, I don't know if like that's all I'm saying. Like, if okay, like and like I said, it's not going to be viewed that way because when you go look up the specific trade, that's what's in the trade. When you look at the off season in an aggregate, right. I right. think the Chuck has done a good job and the Flyers have done a good job of making their team better. I think you slam dunk won the Ellis deal. Again, the Gossip Spear trade is is an incomplete. It's weird. I think you lost this trade. I think including the first round pick and. I think it's even much closer. Ristolainen has one year left. It's even right. much closer if you get Buffalo to eat half his cap hit this year. Because then instead of making 5.4, he's making 2.7. And you can spend that extra 2.7 on a third line center. Or that's, You know what that is? That's partial. It's it, To me, that 2.7 goes to your goalies. It's part the Carter Hart deal. Wherever and it goes. Right. But as it sits now, you spent your first round pick... To, on also, a spend, million dollar to also spend more than $5 million on a player who may or may not even be good. And people think he's good, and you see, and people go, oh, well, he's been on the Sabres. What if that's holding him back? What if he's really better than that? I don't know the advanced stats well enough to know, but I have heard advanced stats people talking about the fact that Rasmus Ristolainen was the anchor. <laughs> Right, that he was the re- part of the, the reason they were dragging along behind right. the I, boat. Right, I saw a stat, and it was something along the lines. Please do not quote me. Uh, when Rasmus Ristolainen's on the ice, Jack Eichel's expected goals is somewhere in the neighborhood of forty-six percent. When Rasmus Ristolainen is off the ice, Jack had, uh, Jack Eichel's uh, expected goals goes up to fifty-five percent. <laughs> and that's since Jack Eichel has been drafted. Since they've both been there. And if that's that's the part I'm worried about. I'm not saying that Rasmus Ristolainen is going to be a black hole on defense and that he's, you know, Andrew McDonald 2.0, although I am concerned, by the way. Because it's, fair to be con- it's fair to be concerned. <laughs> right. Because it's also, it's prime, prime for the bad AMAC extension. Sure. And you know okay. it. All right. So here's, let's, let's try to dissect this a little further for okay. before, before we almost an hour into the show get to the really big one that and we need to get phew, to. we do okay here's here's where i'm at with this so because like i said on the surface this is not a great trade right 
the price is high because of the first rounder. The cap didn't make sense either because the two things that I kept coming away from that I didn't like about this trade were this is not who I trade the first round pick for. And so you made the trade for Gostas Bear with the two picks to get rid of him to open up four and a half million dollars in cap. And the very next day you made a trade that sent your first rounder out to bring in five point four million dollars of cap. So you mentioned that so, if if you look at the this pit trade and the Ellis trade, they kind of even out to the point where you're kind of okay with the first round being involved. If you combine this with the Shane Gosses beer trade, you traded Robert Hag, Shane Gosses beer, a first, two seconds, and a seventh for Erasmus Ristolainen. Right. See, and that's okay. And and again, like it, it perception is going to be important here because of the fact that if you just looked at that and said that these two moves are linked, and as a result of them being linked. It means that you, you are getting. Six assets. You gave up six assets, including two current players and a first round pick for and a four defenseman picks total. Right for a defenseman who, for one, makes close to what the other two did because you take the four point five and the one point six from the two players we're talking. It's what six million dollars, six point one, and he makes five point four. So I, I have a question. Okay. Remember when the Flyers weren't willing to spend? A large sum to acquire Seth Jones because they weren't sure if he was going to resign here. Right. You spent your first round pick on Rasmus first line, and are you expecting him to resign here? Because he's making five point four. Ah, man, I don't know. I'm nervous. I'm nervous about not only him There's, being on okay. the team. Okay, hang on. Because I think it's fine, but it, right, he's going to be a fine player not, on the team. I, I'm going to try to talk you off the ledge. I'm and, nervous about and, the future and, and, here. All right, hold on. I'm going to talk you off the ledge a little bit, and okay. again, it's, it's not to defend the player. Right. I don't what I don't think was going to happen was in hindsight. Now that we know more that followed this trade as well. You make this you made this trade because you knew that Travis Sanheim needed a partner. I think it was very clear. Hold on. It was very clear. You did not want that partner to be Justin Braun. You wanted Justin Braun to play Fair. somewhat a somewhat sheltered role and to at this point based on everything that we know, because let's face it, you're down three defensemen from the previous roster. You've brought in two, so you've replaced, but you're down three defensemen from the previous roster. You know who the third guy is who's replacing them? It's Cam York, more than likely. So what you wanted was for Cam York to slot in to a spot where his minutes can be managed, and you put him alongside of, I'm just taking a guess, I don't know, because Braun's 34. So what? A you think it's twelve to thirteen year veteran in the league. So who do you think is the seventh? Then you think it's a guy like Zamula, Sam Moran, Sam Moran. Listen, you know I love me some Sam Moran because because to me that is they're they're resigning him. It's going to happen at some point soon. Like sure, it's a fairly minor deal. Let, yeah. It will be. And let's put it this way, I'm I'm willing to because he's because he's within the Flyers, so they don't have to wait for anything. I wouldn't be shocked if that's the Monday news drop. That's how soon it could be. Like I'm, I wouldn't it, be surprised. Also, you know, but regardless. Well, and now that we're out of the now, we're, now that we're out of the expansion woods, I expect to see Sanheim cleared up pretty quick and Hart cleared up pretty quick. And it's time to shift your focus a little bit, especially because I don't know if they're going after any of the big free agents. But. Right. And, and look, okay. So back to Ristolainen for one moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's fair to be nervous about this one. It's fair to think they paid too much. It's fair to question how this is going to work out. All of that is fair. If you and if everybody's right, then you're right. That's all I'm going to say. But if you're wrong, like someone's going to collect receipts of the way that the reaction was that day. Certainly. And listen, I know in our group text, I talked a lot about how much I didn't like this trade and how nervous I was about Ristolainen and, and how much he's an analytics black hole. Right. So here's the funny part for me because I had the same kind of feeling because a week ago, this is last Sunday. I'm sitting there. This is aftermath of the Ellis trade. The rumors for Tarasenko were swirling. And then all of a sudden, I did see Ristolainen's name pop up. And I kind of sat there as I'm going through. And look, this is, and truthfully, this is me being objective, not being like fan like because I do cover the team. So this is me being objective, going, I've, I've always liked Ryan Ellis. I liked him with Nashville. It's a good fit. I really like it. Tarasenko, if you had found a way to acquire him, would be kind of a shot in the arm for the fan base because you've lacked a player that's electrifying that for flashy so long. flashy name goal right? scorer. Right. right, so you've lacked a player who has that kind of... Like, let's put it this way. I even Tarasenko, Tarasenko might have a top five shot release sure. in the NHL. And, 
Not only that, but I actually went back and looked it up because I was, for whatever reason, out of curiosity. Do you know that the year that the, that the Blues won the Stanley Cup, Vladimir Tarasenko was the second best selling jersey in the league? I absolutely buy that because he was incredible. So that my year. point, my point being, the end of last year, you couldn't sell out thirty five hundred seats. You're going to not have many problems if your off season started with. Tarasenko Ryan Ellis jerseys. and Vladimir Tarasenko. Yeah. Okay, so that's that's where I was at, and then the Ristolainen, like Ristolainen's name popped up, and I kind of like sat there and went, "Oh, Chuck, you were off to such a good start with this. Like for an off season that was critical, for an off season that could mean your job's on the line, you were off to a really good start. Ryan Ellis, good fit, didn't. And by the way, to go back to your point about Seth Jones for a moment, you didn't take the bait. You didn't take the bait on." knowing that you needed a clear-cut top pairing. because Can you imagine if you would have sat there and said, I'm not getting Seth Jones for the one-year possible rental for right. Rasmus Ristolainen as my top pair guy? As a one-year rental. Right. They didn't do that. At least that, he went out and got good. Ryan Ellis first and said, this is my top pairing guy. And not only You're did right. I get him to be my top pairing guy, I've got him for six years, and Seth Jones would only apparently would only sign in two places. That's the story. Hey, right. So, so, so if Seth Jones wasn't going to sign, and then by the way, signed for eight years and nine and a half nine million and a half per, per, no, thank you. I'll take. I will take Ryan Ellis and the three point two five million dollars of cap savings for the next six years. Thank you very much. All right. So all show, we've been talking about the team, the culture, the salary cap. There's one move left, and it really sums up all of that. Right, you save a little cap room. You make a massive, 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 massive culture change. And you send Jake Voracek to the Columbus Blue Jackets in exchange one-for-one hockey trade with Cam Atkinson. Kevin, give me your thoughts here. Cam Atkinson. This was really an old-fashioned hockey trade because this was just straight up one-for-one. Did did somebody tweet out the trade is one-for-one? Oh, yeah. Somebody had to. That a lot of them did. Here, and here's the thing. The trade being one for one, I spent five to ten minutes until it was actually out there. Not convinced that there still wasn't salary retained in this good old-fashioned hockey trade. Or a pick one, or something. One for one something. was fine, but I'm sitting there going, they had to eat salary, right? They had to. And the fact that they didn't is the biggest win of the deal. So let's... It absolutely is. It was the most important part of the trade. Because no you matter get... What, you get that Jake Voracek 8.3 whether, right. cap hit. And this is the thing. Whether, whether you think Jake Voracek is a better player than Cam Atkinson or not, the the cap relief here was massive. And just because let's put it this way, from my own perspective, I, I if I'm on the if I'm on ninety seven three on Monday, which I kind of expect to be, because this was this is the trade. It, I'm right. going to sit there and probably express how happy I am that I will not have to answer another question about whether or not they have the ability to trade Jake Voracek's contract. Right, it's been done. Now here's the thing. I, I'm I, again, we're jumping around a little. Sure. Back to wrist aligning for a moment because once they made that deal, I thought this was impossible. Really? I just I, I thought there's no way and and that was what was so like that was what was so mind mind boggling about the wrist align and trade was you just made a trade taking a gamble on a defenseman who's struggled his entire career, but he's played for Buffalo. So you're basically trying to figure out in the next year, is it Buffalo Does or he is suck it or him? is it Buffalo? Right. right. Is it Buffalo or is it him? And you're taking the gamble that it's not him. You're praying and, it's and, him. Right. And, it's not him. And then not only that, but here's the thing. This is another thing that's going to go into play with, like you said, the contract extension if they were to do it, is let's say – because the good news is they are not giving him a contract extension during the rest of the offseason. They are going to let – Did they say that? He said we've got to see how things play out. Fantastic. Perfect. At least that's his words. Now, listen. I hope that's not – let's see what free agents I can sign, and if we can't sign any, then I'll give him the extension. (laughs) I don't see it because I don't think you're getting a hu- like. I think they know they're not getting anything huge in free agency. Like, like, I, I and I believe I'm, if I'm I'm taking a guess. I hope I'm right. I don't remember off the top of my head. I think it was Charlie O'Connor's question during the press conference where he he asked about is there still a way you see possibly more franchise altering moves because everything they've done to this point has been kind of franchise altering foundational. Right, like you're shaking the core here. Yeah. Um, in, unless you trade Ivan Provorov, Claude Giroux, or Sean Couturier, and I don't think any of the three are going anywhere, no, it's hard to make a bigger move than the things you've done. Right. So he asks that question, and Chuck kind of laughed and like because he because and kind of goes, 
I don't know about franchise altering per se. Like, like in terms of, like, I don't have that much, you know, leverage. He here doesn't have that much make, wiggle room left. Right. Like, I don't have that. Like, well, not only that, but I'm sure his head hurts just about as much as the rest of us with trying to figure out how do you add it all up that these guys fit a five point four million dollar contract. There's a five point eight million dollar contract near five point nine in there. There's a six point two five million dollar contract. So, in other words, think about this. In the three players you've acquired, you added something uh, in the in the range of like seventeen to eighteen million dollars in cap space. But that means you also got rid of probably about I, I don't I don't have them. Well, it's got to be close. Well, I mean, Ghost like, was four and a half. Jake was almost eight and a half. That's thirteen right there. Robert Haig was one point six. Myers was um two, Myers, two Myers was two point five. I think I thought it was two two five. No two. It was like two five five. Oh, uh, was it? Oh yeah. Yeah, so you're looking at you're looking at about the same. They're in roughly kind of the same cap spot they were before. Uh, like we talked about a couple of weeks ago, obviously they still do have to sign. Um, who's left? Sanheim and Sanheim Hart. Myers or Sam Sanheim Hart. Sorry, don't have to resign Myers anymore. I, I'm all over the place with names. I'm also thinking I, I'm I'm trying to do the math on the contracts. Really right quick. now, according to Cap Friendly, the Philadelphia Flyers are sitting on roughly twelve point four million dollars. Well, cap that's space. key too because. If you made three trades, got three players, traded a lot of other players as part of it, and still came out with twelve and a half, thirteen million dollars in cap space for your number one goalie, one of you got to get all your goalies. Well, yeah, I know, but for you your number get all one, your goalies. but but for your number one specifically for your number one for your number three defenseman at this point, probably a backup Pro, goalie, three four, yeah. your second, well, pair, three four, yeah. but yeah, a backup goalie. And maybe something else. I mean, if you think that's possible, but even then, so in fairness, give the two guys that are restricted free agents seven to eight million dollars of that. You still have five and a half million dollars to spend on the backup goalie, which, in my opinion, shouldn't cost you much more than two million dollars. So you half, might, right? so you might have three million dollars to go out and say maybe there's another defenseman out there, maybe there's a forward. Is there a world where the Flyers are heavy after Anton Hudobin? Uh, I don't know about that. I keep, the name I keep coming back to is more or less is James Reimer. Because, man, I don't know. Anton Hudobin sounds like the perfect, perfect goalie to help usher Carter Hart into starting so, 50 games so, a year. I, 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 I Look, I'd say Linus Olmark or James Reimer are great fits here. I think they're logical. Um, I, now, I, I got asked this question yesterday on Twitter, actually. So this is a fun little exercise really quick because I, we, and we'll, get, yeah. we get back, we'll get back into the Atkins and Vorkin. We are getting to the end of the show. We're working towards a wrap here for sure. <laughs> well, and, we, and we really haven't even talked about the biggest trade yet, not to mention all the other stuff. I know. Like we're going we're gonna to try to do as much as we can in the next, say, 20 minutes or so. Um, so I got asked last night on Twitter, what kind of goalies could they target? And is there also any like 3C, 4C options out there that they could still like, assuming that it costs $8 million for Hart and Sanheim combined, what else is out there that they could get, I guess, low end signings to, for backup goalie or 3, 4C? I instantly go to those two goalies I just mentioned. I think they would be logical fits. Certainly there are others out there that would also make a lot of sense. I just wonder if they're going to demand too much money. So I would be concerned about that. Like you got to be mindful of that and still get a good fit. Sure. And it's more, and it, look, if you're going to spend a, a majority of whatever you have left after those two contracts, do it on the goalie because it's really important. You've already, look, you've already made a clear emphasis and look, whatever everybody wants, whatever you want to think about wrist aligning and certainly what people majority seem to think about Ellis, you put, you definitely put the focus on the back end. There's no question. You made changes to your defensive core. You certainly That's did. clear. Yeah. So you very clearly said we're putting better people or what we think are better people in front of our goaltenders. Okay. So in that case, you need to make sure your goalies are right. There is no doubt in my mind, and Fletcher seemed to say so, that Carter Hart is the guy now. He's the guy moving forward. There is no change there. There is no lack of confidence in him. So what you all you try to do is give him more support. Whether whether Ristolainen does it or not is a gamble. Ellis will do it. For sure. I have no doubt in my mind that Ellis will. And then you're also taking a chance, but you need to have another guy. And, and Fletcher said, actually didn't say it on the press conference, he said it on NHL Network during the draft. He envisions at least kind of a 50-30 split in goalies, just given the way the schedules look. Okay. So if you need a guy who's going to start for 30 games, he's going to have to be good. It's n And let's put it this way. If you need any indication, he got asked on the broadcast, about Brian Elliott specifically, and then okay. and then he never mentioned Elliott's name. 
I would say Brian Elliott is as good as gone. Probably done here. Yeah. Because I think what you're thinking here is I need a guy who can, if necessary, start three or four games in a row in place of Carter Hart. In the event of anything, a you slump, have to have somebody reliable an injury, there. anything. Yep. And I don't look. I think it's going to be hard to find a goalie because I look. People will sit there and go, "Well, Olmark was hurt for a decent chunk of last year. Reimers had injuries. There's people out there, but there's people out there that are vying for Jonathan Bernier, and I feel the same way about Bernier. You know what it is? I don't think you're going to find a goalie who hasn't gone through something. They get hurt because. It's a physically demanding position. So Turns they get out playing hurt. 60 minutes a night is tough. <laughs> and playing the way you have to in that position. And playing on now, your knees half Now, the in time, fairness, right. I, I, it was for the first time when prompted with this question, I hadn't really thought about the 3C, 4C option on a budget anyway. Right. If you asked me 3C, 4C option with whatever cap space I could, I would tell you if Philip Deneau is going to market, take a look, please. Man, if Philip you Deneau know? is going to market, <sighs> trade anybody you have to to clear the space. Well, I don't know if he's got much left to trade. That's the problem. I think everybody else he's got left to trade, they actually want to have. That's but, fair. But here's, but, so I said, based on the free agency list anyway, I went as a 3C or 4C option, more likely going to be an internal fill, but perhaps if the price isn't too high, think a Derek Broussard or Sean Corrali type maybe. Okay. You know, that's the depth that I think you could try to utilize and still get something out of. I, I'm not saying it's going to be those two guys specifically. It's just... Think like that, and maybe you'll get something. Now let's get back to Voracek. I was going to say, let's get on this trade real quick, because this is, again, this is probably the most um, culture shock of the trade. Sure. Okay. So Because, again, we're talking about a guy me, who's worn so, an A and has been here yeah. for a decade. So you asked me my thoughts. If I was yeah. great, if, if I had to put a grade on the Ryan Ellis trade, I would have probably given it an A, because I, I, I thought the fit was good. I thought it took care of the biggest need. And you didn't give up that much. In the the return was things. nothing. The right. return that, that, that Nashville needed and then to flip one of the guys anyway is not that big of a deal. And I think, look, to an extent, I almost look at the Ellis trade and go, I'm, I'm more OK giving up Myers if it means I get like I found a taker for Nolan Patrick. Like, it's almost like when you do, yeah. you know, when you find you go, how did anybody take that guy based on what you've seen? Right. Then you kind of live with the other guy who you go, well, that's a little tougher with to part positive with. positive value but, attached. Right. right. So you had to do that. So I give that one an A. The rest of the one, I would say I'm not going to give it an F because I'm it's not, not going ne- any no. higher than a D. That's about where I am. At and it might be a D minus. If I, I peak out at C minus, but, but more likely a D with the it's a, it's a D with the first round pick included. Right. It's a, you know, it's a C to C minus for the player. Right, it could go up to. And like honestly, if Ristolainen's half retention, I probably go up to a full. That's fair too. C. I think I think C is fair too. C or C minus is fair too. If, if we're just talking about the player with half retention, there. yeah, that's yep. that's that's fair. And when you're giving up your first round pick, you should have. This is this now, is the move I have the most problem. And with. Yeah, right, exactly. The, the the giving up the first round pick drops it a letter, right off the bat. So I, like I'm almost sitting here telling you the player is like a C C minus by himself. With potential that look, you hope he goes upward, but, but giving up the thirteenth overall up the pick first drags it down was a problem. Yeah, um, the Atkinson to vo- for Voracek trade, I am grading that kind of a B to a B plus. I agree with potential for an A, and here is why. I this feels like an. Granted, it's not exactly the same type of deal because that was more or less a sign and trade, if you will. This feels like the Kevin Hayes deal, where. You don't feel like it's a complete game changer, like Atkinson's thirty-two. You think is it's he like gonna kind be of a, a level-up trade? You almost want like look. If you ask some people, Voracek is the better player in this deal, and I don't disagree with that. And I, I, I here's where I think that that's fair. You know what you're gonna get with Voracek with Atkinson because it's a goal-scoring thing, and the last two seasons haven't been the best. You're again sort of taking a small gamble here on the player revitalizing his career at 32 33 right and down the line because he's got four years left on his contract it's it's a way smaller cap hit so that that i think that's what like I, I think i sit there and i go cam atkinson to me as a player probably a b and then b plus for getting rid of the contract for of, of getting rid of vorchek's contract straight up no salary retention again so we're back to that the salary the salary the no salary retention bumps you up a little bit in a flat cap nhl world right. salary the salary cap might be the most valuable asset a team has is some cap space 
So and it's because I I've written down in my notes. I have Atkinson certainly can reach twenty to thirty goals easily. Can he match his production or come close? Fifty points would be acceptable. That's what I keep saying. I agree. Uh, and look, like I said, I said feels like the Kevin Hayes deal. Not sure if the player can reach that level, but if he does, he'll be loved. Yes. So like, you saw what happened with Kevin Hayes. The first year was outstanding. Everybody loves the guy. And then the second year was not so great. We now he was playing hurt for most of it, so that's fair. But I have a like, prediction. You saw how that turned. Go ahead. Cam Atkinson's first power play shift. He's not even going to score a goal, but he's going to take four shots on the same power play, and the fans are going to love him because he actually shoots the puck. Well, that's that's the thing for me. He is a shoot first mentality. He's tenacious. He's going to rip never, four shots on never, that, and the fans are just going to go nuts for it. Yeah, he's tenacious, never takes a shift off, and the team needed players like this. It, it, let's just say, at the end of the day, you know what I, I came from? I, I turned around, I sat there, and I said, with the wrist like with the wrist align and trade, if your thing last year with the Flyers was, this team is soft, this team is not physical. Cam Atkins is not going to help you here. No, no. Here's your answer. Wrist align it. Right. Big, physical, that's what his game is. It's what he's known for. That's your answer to that. If you came away from watching this team and went, this team's lazy, they're lifeless, Cam Atkinson's your answer. Because Cam Atkinson is a ball of energy. And you want to know how I know that without having really – like, I, look, I've watched him over the years because Columbus is an, inter- right. is, is an interdivision team. They come to Philly a lot. It took five minutes in his press conference – to see this guy is quite the personality. Right, and I was going to say, I've heard that he is a fantastic person, and I expect him to be a very, very, very popular target at the Flyers' Wives Carnival, assuming by the that way, comes back in some capacity. And, and and by the way, because earlier in the offseason, you had texted me and asked about the possibility of a particular defenseman who happens to be really good friends with Kevin Hayes. And I said, I don't know. Maybe if it was like a closer to a veteran minimum. No, I don't want the Flyers to sign Keith Yandel. No, no, no. I'm not saying they're going to. You're now getting, in Cam Atkinson, another former college teammate of Kevin Hayes. Oh, I didn't know that. Yes. Oh, we're really really laying the foundation for Johnny Gaudreau, aren't we? Well, okay. Come on. Broads Broads texted me five minutes after this trade went down and went, you know Cam went to BC with Johnny, right? Kevin Hayes centering Johnny Gaudreau, Cam Atkinson. Come on! The the BC line? First line, Couturier, Giroux, Farabee. Right? (laughs) Assuming... And I'm talking... Okay, listen. Not this this upcoming season. 12 months from now. 12 months from now. Top line, Couturier centering Giroux and Farabee. Second line, Hayes centering... Gaudreau and Atkinson. Well, let's not jump too far ahead. This offseason oh, uh, busy. Come enough. on. Have you met me? I'm all about jumping too far ahead. I know. I also want to get to the end of the show and still touch we on the rest We do of have to do that. <laughs> and still touch on the rest of the stuff we have. Um, I will say that. So but basically where I'm going at with this with Atkinson is, is you, for sure and certain, the one thing that people are going to love about him here is you're never going to question if you get an honest effort. You're Good. always going to get an honest effort. Man, but and, I can't wait till the first article that's written about the fact that he's 5'8", 165 pounds soaking wet. Guess what? Watch some highlights. He finds those areas. I know. He's I in, know that. Oh, I in, certainly know this, that. This guy, I, 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 like, maybe, it's the, maybe it's the draft weekend thing for me. I almost said this kid. He's not a kid. He's older than I am, ah, for crying kid. out loud. No, like, no, I feel like I can he say that. He plays a game really, for a living. No, he's a kid. Listen, no, I, I, look, I've, I've said this about a lot of people because these, you know, like, let's like Joel Faraby. I sit there and I talk about him and go, this Stop. kid's good. Joel Faraby is not even, what, barely drinking age. Joel Faraby was born after 2000. Right, exactly. So that's the point. I'm a lot, I am entitled to call Joel Faraby kid because, like, or describe him as a kid because he is significantly younger than I am. I know you already put a title on this podcast. We might have to call it Boomer Cast. We sound like uh, old men right now. No, nah, it's okay. I think I think the title's fine because we'll get into it in a second. But no, you're right. This is. I'm not worried about his size, to be honest. You know why? Because he's fast. He's tenacious. He's he gives you an honest effort, and and I think you're well. And I think you're partially right. The amount that he's going to shoot the puck is going to win him a make, lot of fans. Going, well, let's. Be, I mean, Jake Voracek. In all sincerity, by the way, it wasn't meant to be a jab. In all sincerity, joked about how he had a love-hate relationship with the fans. They're passionate. They want to win. 
the years that he like I, I think like in saying that he what he meant was the years that I was here were not always the best. I can't wait um, for another two months or so then, when he goes uh, back to the Czech Republic and gives an interview in Czech where he rips us because you know it's coming. Maybe because you know and, it's and coming. Turns, you know turns, the guy doesn't and, like. And, but and turns around and says, but like, but they had my back. I always appreciated them, and you know it was kind of fun to hear people tell yelling at you to shoot 17 times a night it's a video and and and, and, and and he's smiling as he says it but at the same time i'm sitting there going guess what is going to kind of deliver on that you we did traded you for a guy who's going to shoot it basically and, and and look before we move on to what chuck fletcher said before we and we on, are going to move on you know, right we might even gloss over the draft picks at this point because they're all, fu- they're all well they're all future anyway so it's not the biggest deal in the world i did mention the first pick that they made of the whole weekend which came at like 12 30 on saturday <laughs> So like, but whatever. Um, I will say this: I know that Jake Voracek was a polarizing figure in this franchise. That there was a that that, that 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 love hate relationship was very much a tr- a real thing. Um, I I will say, over the years, he was certainly when when he was going, he could be a fun player to watch. His emotion was very good. He was an emotional player. I mean, let's let's just say. You and I both, because I believe you said you were. Were you at the Pittsburgh game with four fights in the second? Yes, I period? was. Okay, and I covered that game. And when he comes out of that pile and he's throwing his hands up and the hairs flying, and the place is roaring, that's like, his peak as a Philadelphia Flyer. But that's the moments where you sit there and go, "This guy got the city. He definitely got it." Jake Voracek cared. But oh yeah. But there was, you know, it was the performance. It was the consistency. It was the nights that people Turnovers felt like he was. Line. But it was, and it was the nights that people felt like he's taking the night off. You know, like, you know, and sometimes, in fairness, it was the comments too, because like even early this year, Jake Voracek had said something along the lines of, "It's impossible to play a sixty-minute game." Like, no, like everybody says to do it, but nobody does it. You know, like maybe Jonathan that's Ta- Jonathan Taves would never say something like that. And maybe that's part of the problem because let's go to the next tab and we're skipping one. Let's yeah. go to this. When Chuck Fletcher has made three trades of varying degrees of varying grade levels. Let, and let's put it this way. I, I saw ridiculous grades for the wrist line and trade. And by ridiculous, I mean, you know, on the athletic giving it a J. Like, let's be real. I get it if you don't like the trade. It's not a good trade, be, but it's not a J. Come on. No, but, but don't look. It, don't be ridiculous. Like, don't be ironic Have some respect for the process like, like come right, on like i get it if you don't like it go ahead and say it's an f go ahead and say it's a d i don't care i understand Every that once in a while you want to throw out a z just as well, a no, you like, know right. sure no like because like, like listen i understood it i went on the air right after it happened and explained i don't understand why like you would trade your first round pick for this particular player i don't think this is a very good trade on the surface some like whatever they they were all giving the ellis trade an a and i believe on espn the Atkinson Voracek tra- tra- trade got a B plus for, from the Flyers standpoint. I don't disagree with that because they thought that the Flyers got a player that more balances out what they needed, and freeing up the cap helped. And they gave the Columbus Blue Jackets out of that like a B or B minus because they go Voracek will be a f- a fine fit there. I was gonna say I have no reason. I don't know why Columbus acquired Jake Voracek. I don't get it. But the the one thing I saw that makes a lot of sense was. You could put him on a line with now with Patrick Line and Line is the finisher. Oh, you know what? And that's the setup. Yeah. Now that's they don't valid. have. Now here's the thing: they don't have a lot beyond that. They don't have any centers to win the face off and pass those. Well, two they turned out even said who's going to center that line right. though. But also, you also, I mean, you also traded away your one of your best defensemen. Actually, I'm sorry. Let's do let's do that again. You have Zach Wierenski, but you traded away Seth Jones, and within the last year, David Savard also. Right. So you've got holes in a lot of other areas and and not to mention cam atkinson is no small return for jake Vorchek. well he is literally a small return but. okay in size he's small he makes me feel better about myself because when i i swear if we're in if if we're back in the locker room next year you'll be able I'm to gonna, look somebody in the eye uh no i no because i can already do that with travis connecting too because travis connecting is not a tall dude either but I'm gonna i'll go make, interview I'm, sam face to face i'm gonna feel really good about standing next to Cam Atkinson. You're going to be able to tower over somebody. Look at you. <laughs> I don't know. No, I don't know if I'll tower. I'll be about, eye, like you said, about eye level as well. I don't know if I ever level. interviewed him. I'd sure tower. Yeah, I know. Almost a foot taller. Uh, all right. Is, so who, who, is, who is the guy? There was a guy I definitely, oh, oh I know. It was, it was the first time I interviewed Anthony Stolarz. He was six, tall. At 6'6". Six, six, I, yeah. felt, I felt 
insanely small in that moment. All right. So um, we need to change uh, the mood in the room with the quote from Chuck. There's so much to dissect from this. I mean, the, uh, the, it, we will probably talk more about this in two weeks on our next show. Honestly, we'll probably still be. Breaking right, well, the, oh, well, no, next, I'm sorry. We're doing a show next week, week aren't we? And There's we will not, probably continue is, to break this down okay. next week. There is no way next week we have this many roster moves to talk about. Knock on wood. Say, Chuck, challenge, that, the challenge never. has been laid. If Chuck keeps me working this hard during this, like, let's just say, like, I'm not used to working this hard during an, like, an NHL offseason in, in the end in of July. July right. Like, this is late June into, you know, I should be thankful as, you know what? I should be thankful as all hell. That the off season was delayed by a month. You're because not, you're not wrong. No, because could you imagine if it, let's just try to rewind a month earlier? Maybe not, because like if draft weekend would have been the twenty third and twenty fourth or whatever, it would have been of, of June or something close to that. We're talking about the weekend I had the, my wedding reception Good a luck. year late, right? Like, yep. could you imagine if in the middle of all that going on, Chuck Fletcher's going, "Hey, by the way, here's Jake Voracek for Cam Atkinson being traded." Right. Like, like your like, phone starts ringing in the what? middle of the reception. Right. Like, I hey, I, they got Rasmus Ristolainen. The you know, you know, do you know the only thing that would have worked is if it would have followed like been the day after the Ellis trade. Like okay. expansions coming up Sunday to Wednesday is nothing. I would have gotten away. Out. I would have gotten away with it, but but you still would have spent the whole day talking about the Ellis trade. But I'm out. I'm I'm thanking. I'm so thankful that this didn't happen a month ago. That this well, is all good. happening now. All right. But, so, but these comments, like these comments, were I, I probably could have written the whole article around the whole quote package because everything was super telling. The the idea that more energy, more juice needed to change the culture in the room or the mood in the room needed. He, he, uh, cause Fletcher didn't say culture. He said culture kind of gets thrown around a lot, but he, he said multiple times this offseason they were too easy to play against. He said multiple times, uh, talked multiple times about the leadership and guys who want to come to the rink and want to work with their teammates and want to, I guess, to an extent, create this environment that's any good. Like he, he, who like, wants to be a bleep and flyer. Not only that, but like it, it, the way he said it, like with last year, he goes like last year wasn't a good year for anybody. There was a malaise in the room. You know, we had no energy. Nobody smiled. Like it was a tough year it, for a lot and, of teams, and, and we've I, talked about it before. But I think the Flyers, being a bit of a younger team, it hit them hard. Yeah, and well, not only that, but he also had said things, said things along the lines of, kind of like. Not only that was a tough year in that sense, but that the younger guys that they banked on didn't give enough of what they thought they were going to get. Right. And it's really interesting to watch Phil Myers and Nolan Patrick and even maybe even a Robert Haig type because Robert Haig is not the oldest guy on the team. But he's, a vet. he's, he's established vet at this point. He is, but at the same time, he's still one of the younger guys, if you will. Yeah. To sit there and say, after one year of that, we feel like we can move you because we didn't get enough. And we need to go and get something that's more established in that area. Chuck's had some urgency for sure. And and that's kind of been the big thing. Uh, all right. We're uh, hitting a little we're, bit of a time crunch here. So we're, we're getting gonna, close. I'm going to I'm going to stay on this for a couple seconds really quick. OK. Just because th- this was the most important thing of the weekend for me outside of the trades was all this stuff that was being said because it was very eye opening to listen to quotes that talked about the energy of the room that talked about a lot of stuff like that. Like, let me see where some of his quotes come up. Um. Because he look, he loves Cam Atkinson, and I get that. I get why you would. He talked oh, like how many? He goes how many times have we talked about slow starts over the years? Like, I got the impression, and uh, like, l- like, listen to this one. Here's another one. It was time for Jake to go to a new team and re-energize, and it was time for us to bring in new players and go in a different direction. This is a guy who, after all of the stuff with not the right mix, but like, or like he had said, not the right mix during the regular season. He had said there at one point in time they talked about trending in the right direction. And that might have been AV, but still, trending in the right direction. They talked about like stuff, a bunch of stuff that made it sound like they're not going to do much. Like that they still are going to take a leap of faith that it was just a bad year and run it back possibly. And then you read this stuff and you go, holy crap, he actually saw what everybody else saw. Chuck he's is reading not resting thing, on like, any laurels. He's, he saw exactly what everybody else saw. and And he's willing to do something about it. And listen, I had put out there from Cam Atkinson's press conference, you just listen to the guy, and he's pumped up about this. He's excited. He's ready to come here. And 
you're going to get a new energy all right. And like even yeah. down to, okay, did it I, – I don't know if – I don't think it made its way into our group chat. Did you see the tweet from Claude Giroux? No. Okay, so so apparently one of the questions at Chuck Fletcher's press conference had to do with – because he mentioned about changing the leadership group up a little bit and that there were things that they could do to get more experience and all stuff like that. And Claude Giroux uh, – the, the question came up about, the, about this leadership group. Is Claude Giroux's role going to change? Somebody actually asked the question. And Fletcher, without thinking about anything, goes, no, he's our captain. Which Sam Carcitti tweeted out. Fletcher says, Giroux's still the captain. And Giroux followed it up by tweeting at him, nice scoop, Sam. Good one. Or something like that, right? I'm looking like, at it right now. It's a good scoop, Sam. Good scoop. I got a text from friends about it. And That's my funny. You know, and my response back was, need juice, need energy, change the mood in the room. Like, this is a guy who now is kind of going, I see what's going on. I like what's going on. It's going to be tough because Voracek's gone and God's despair has gone. And he, how many years has go, uh, has Drew played with these guys? It's well, maybe, been a lot. But maybe, maybe Claude has decided. Change. Maybe Claude has decided now that Jake's not here, he's the one who has to be grumpy with the media. Oh, that would be funny. I don't know. <laughs> All right. We're, uh, we're running up a li- against a little bit of a time wall here. The good news is we will be back next week. Yeah. We that will be question back is on week. the table for next week's show. This will be discussed free, next week. Right. Free agency opens on Wednesday, and yep. as we've said, they need a backup goalie. They might try to get a defenseman or a forward that's been mentioned, yep. but they might stick to internally. So they so <laughs> it's kind of like what Fletcher had said on Friday, right? We're not going to make it. I don't see us making a trade in whatever time LOL. or thing. Right. And then the next morning, it's like, uh, yeah, just kidding. Right? Just kidding. We traded away Jake Voracek so, one so, for one. So he says that they might go internal, but they might not because, you know, but they could try to look to sign somebody. They could keep trading. I don't think they've got another trade, but I'm not holding anything past Chuck Fletcher because Chuck Fletcher's been Chuck Fletcher's been a man of action this entire week. I mean, certainly has quite quite frankly, I, I would question if Chuck Fletcher has slept this week and he admitted he hasn't gotten much sleep and that Cam Atkinson was his like third cup of coffee. We the energy level about, on the phone call with Cam Atkinson woke him up a little more. We talked about all these moves and we didn't even touch on the draft. I am going to rattle off the names of the guys that the Flyers drafted real quick. Uh, oh, second good, round. Good, good luck. Uh, second round, Samu Twomala. I'm assuming that's how that's pronounced. If I pronounce any of these wrong, yep, I apologize. Samu Twomala. Uh, third round, Alexei Kolosov. That's a nice, easy Russian name. There you go. Yep. Or I'm sorry, Belarusian. No, he's from. Yes. Oh, sorry, yeah, he is Bel- Russian. I apologize. He plays in Belarus, but plays he is in Russian. Belarus. Yes. Brian Zanetti, good Irish kid. That's a joke. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, he's from Lugano, Switzerland. Okay, the, the next couple aren't as bad, by the way, because right. they're coming up to what? Is Ty the, Murchison Ty from Murchison. Corona, California. And then you're going to follow it up with Ethan Sampson. Ethan Sampson from British and, Columbia. And Owen McLaughlin, who, by the way, as oh, a... There's a good Irish kid. Come on boy. now. Give me yeah. Owen McLaughlin. Oh, I'll, I'll stick to Zanetti. You know, I'm, just, I'm just kidding. But, Owen McLaughlin oh, but, uh, makes the team. He's got to match my tattoo. Okay, but oh, hang on a second. But Owen McLaughlin, by the way, from Spring City, Pennsylvania. Chester County. Chester County, local kid, going to Penn State. Went to Valley Forge. It did, had some experience at Valley Forge. Also went to the Hill School for a little in Pottstown. So, yep. you know, all local areas certainly to me. So Absolutely. He's, so he's uh not he's not a uh, they'll have a close eye on him in the next few years because of the fact that when he goes to college, you know, Penn State's yep. not he's a far State. trip, you know, to go and watch him. So, and yep. not only that, but you know, what 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 have we loved about Cam York and guys like like. It's not hard to find a Michigan game on TV sometimes. No. Penn Guess State's the same way. You can we're going to watch Penn You're State, gonna State versus Michigan guy. a lot. Yep. I mean, yeah, the problem is, is now they don't have a Michigan prospect anymore because I'm pretty sure he's going to be a flyer next year. No, you're probably right. All right. Which, well, which, but, which, 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 by the way, to, for Ryan Ellis to not take that number, because that, that was the easy thing to do was just say, I can't have four. I'll take 44. Right. Or, well, well, Cam York was 45 last year, but I'm pretty sure Cam York's got 44 lined up. Is is forty four not spoken for? You think? I don't believe organizationally. It I mean, the last the, the last guy I remember wearing it was like Nate Thompson and Chris Stewart. Oh, so. you're right. I forgot. I forgot so that people spoken. did wear it after Chemo Team. Oh yeah, it's been used. Oh, okay. So so I it's available. I think I think it I think it belongs to a defenseman who plays kind of a relatively similar game. Uh, Fair the, enough. Ryan Ellis is ninety four. 
is going to be interesting that nobody's ever worn that number in history. I was going to mention that when we talked about. I was going to mention that when we talked about Jake real quick. It, Jake was the first player I remember having like a super high number, like on purpose. And yet he wasn't the first player in Flyers history to wear 93. Oh, weird. Because they had two others before Jake, I believe. Okay. Two others before Jake because it was well, way back in the day. Peter Nedved used it for like a Peter the cup Nedved. of coffee he had here. Wow, remember and Peter that, Nedved? Yeah, well, uh, okay, I'm going to hit you with another one because you know who the only other guy who wore it was? Uh, Valerie Zelopukin. No, Valerie Zelopukin wore like I think wore twenty six. Okay. Um, no, um, Nikolai Zherdev. Ooh, that's a good one. Remember him? Yeah, I do. Well, that's All okay. Right. Cause, that's okay because guess what? I believe. I mean, the rumor is it was not confirmed by the team, but Cam Atkinson's got number eighty nine plastered all over his social media. Interesting. In Flyers font. Interesting. All which right. To me, means he's going to wear number eighty nine, which I don't recall being used since Sam Gagne was here. So- <laughs> Maybe you're right. I, I, you know, I, I, we're just we're all about the jersey numbers. Jersey numbers are fun. There are there are people who I think will buy Cam Atkinson jerseys. So if you're watching on our YouTube channel, the graphic we have on the screen, what's next oh. for the? It's okay. What's next for the Flyers off season? That's the question we're gonna have for next week. And you can uh, you tweet us at tweet at us at YWT podcast well, on Twitter. Yeah, Let well, us know what you think they're gonna do between now and then. Sure. We're gonna have the I, opening of free agency. Well, and that, and this is the key because. We'll talk more about Chuck Fletcher's comments from this weekend then, and probably I wouldn't be shocked if there's more to come, that he puts kind of a bow on this thing. By the time we do next week's show, we'll pretty much know what the deal is. I think we're going to know a lot of what the roster looks like. Yep. And that would allow him to speak on what he's done collectively. He already kind of has to an extent, but like there's – he didn't – the one look, this is the last quote I'll leave us with from – Fletcher's press conference because he said the exciting thing is is that he doesn't think they're necessarily done he thinks they still can make improvements and upgrades and make other moves so that's what's interesting is that you you look at this and go four trades this week three new players acquired a lot of money brought in with a lot of money going out and he still doesn't think they're done and he has a little bit of cap space to work with I mean they're not and listen they're not done by next week they're going to have another goaltender behind Carter Hart there's no question but but what it's, happens? If, but what happens if we're talking about another center or another defenseman on top of it? Like it's possible. It's Chuck's world. We're just living in it. And yeah, no, uh, I'm really living in it yep. because every time I blink, I mean, as soon as the Voracek trade happened and Friedman's tweet came up, I shared it and went on. I retweeted it on Twitter and went, "Oh boy, here we go again." Yep. Cause, and because uh, like I totally didn't see it coming again. He said no more trades. What happened? What yep. happened, Chuck? You said it no feels more like trades, everything's coming. And then it feels I had to like work everything's coming out of the blue. Yep. <laughs> uh, well, listen, Chuck will keep. Hopefully, Chuck keeps you busy this week and next week. Oh, we have just Chuck's as keep, much to Chuck's talk about. Chuck's keeping me on my toes all week. It's for sure. Until then, make sure to follow us on Twitter at YWT Podcast for all the latest as it breaks. Follow Kevin at Kevin underscore Durso. <laughs> make sure you can find the you can find the show anywhere. You can find your podcast, including YouTube and also SportsTalkPhilly dot com. We love them for supporting us here. And uh, man. Kevin's been busy over there. Make sure you go check out the website. <laughs> click on all the articles. I'm really lucky. I've got a vacation coming up the second weekend of August, Ooh, or, the, or the first, or the first full weekend, however you want to look at it. But hopefully, I, but hopefully Chuck's done by then. He better be. All right. I'll have, I'll have my stuff with me just in case. But we'll we'll see you guys next week. Another full show for you next week. See you later.